been so good. And I'm not talking about the length of time that we have to minister, but the Lord really spoke to me Monday. I don't know how the Lord does with you, but and he doesn't do it in a mean way, and I don't take it that way, and it's not that way. And I thank God that he does correct me, and he talks to me, and he, and he uh, speaks to me about what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I thank God for the holy correction of the Lord. And I want the Lord to convict me. I want to feel conviction. I want to be directed by the Lord. I don't want to just go out and just do what I want to do. I mean, I don't want to do that. I, I did that before I came to God, and what a mess I made of my life. And I don't want to do that no more. And I can do that if I wanted to. I could get out and just tonight and decide to do what I want to do and preach. And maybe I've done it long enough. This will be my 39th year. Uh, maybe I've done it long enough that I could do it without him in a way that, uh, you know, but it wouldn't be the same. I wouldn't get the same results. And I wouldn't have the presence of God and walk with God and have the blessings of the Lord. I'd have the blessings of people but not the blessings of the Lord. And that's what I want. I'm not ever comfortable talking about myself. But I am very comfortable talking about the Lord. I am very open. I'm very enthusiastically embracing the Lord and what he does. Uh, I'm not a, ashamed or afraid to admit my failures or my, or my shortcomings. And, and I'm not, uh, I don't have it all made. I don't have all faith. The Lord told me that nobody has perfect faith. Not yet. And uh, because I was always condemning myself and talking about what didn't get done and in my early part of my ministry. And I never had time to enjoy what the Lord did or give him praise or to get better because I was so blinded by my shortcoming. And the Lord began to tell me, he said, You're, you don't have perfect faith. And he said, you might have it for a moment, for a little while. He said, but nobody has perfect faith. He said, you get to know people and what they are when they're walking in perfect faith is not what they are during the day sometimes when they're facing their own dilemmas. Remember Elijah, what, what a great prophet of God he was, but he found himself sitting under the tree and bemoaning his own situation, fearing Jezebel. Well, he had just seen great miracles from God. What about Israel? They had seen great miracles from God. They had seen deliverance. They had come out of Egypt. And they had seen the mighty hand of God set them free and deliver. And yet here they are in the wilderness complaining and having a, a spirit of bickering about themselves and didn't even want to follow the Lord. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And even they were not perfect. And so here are the apostles. Look at Peter. Uh, he went to, uh, he went to uh, Paul and said, Paul, you need to get these Gentiles circumcised. And, uh, and yet Paul said circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And we know that water baptism, according to Romans, that water baptism is a circumcision. The Holy Ghost is. And this is the spiritual circumcision of the New Testament church. And yet they were used of God, and God used them greatly in the Holy Ghost. Paul saw great things in God, didn't he? Yet he had to be rescued. He had to jump in a basket. And they lowered him down outside the window of a home. And he ran through the night, fearful that he would be killed, and found some place to hide till the sun came up. And somebody led him to another place and fed him. And there he was running from one place to another. And yet the Lord was with him and mighty. We condemn ourselves and we put ourselves down and we think we've got to be perfect. And I want to tell you something. You do not have to be perfect to live for God. But you do have to be forgiven. And uh, we want to strive for perfection. I wouldn't dare lower the bar down for you or myself or any of my children. I want to reach up as high as I can. And I want to walk as close as I can with God. But I feel like the apostle. I, I haven't arrived yet. I know I, I have not yet comprehended. I have not yet apprehended. I, I'm not there yet. And I'm still as hungry for God as I've ever been hungry for God. I want, the, uh, I want the presence of God tonight. Just like I did that night, I went to the altar and got the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody in here that still hungers, still desires the supernatural in the presence of the Lord? If you do, let the Lord know it right now by lifting your hands and lifting your countenance unto God and let's give him praise right now and invite his will not just his presence, but let's invite his will into this service right now that he will do whatever he wants to do in this place. Father, I commend my spirit to you. I give it to you. 
I give you my mind. I give you my praise. I give you my strength. Lord, tonight, anoint us mightily in the Holy Ghost. I ask it in Jesus' name tonight. I'm reading a scripture from Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 7. 7 and 7, that's pretty balanced. 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you will look at this, you will see it's a progression of receiving from God that you ask. And if you ask, and if that's not sufficient, then you start seeking. And if you seek and that's not sufficient, then you start knocking on the door. In other words, if you're asking and there's no answer, then you start seeking. And if that doesn't get you where you need to be, then you need to start knocking on the door. The Lord said there must be found inside of you a hunger, a desire to seek my will and to seek what I have. There's something about the things of God that have to be sought after, folks. You're not just going to walk in the house of God with any kind of attitude, with any kind of atmosphere, with any kind of, uh, of, of, of coming to God just in a way and get anything from God. You've got to come asking and you've got to come seeking and you've got to come knocking. I say it this way in church all the time. There are people that pray and say, oh, I don't want the man of God to pray for me. And there are some that are praying, Lord, let the man of God pray for me tonight. And I say both of them are going to get their prayers answered. Those that say I don't want to be prayed for are not going to get prayed for. And those that are asking to be prayed for are going to be prayed for one way or another. Because it's what you're asking, what you're seeking is what you're going to get. If you want to hide behind somebody, then that's what you'll do tonight. But if you want what God's got for you, you're going to be after it. You're going to be hungry for it. You're going to be seeking after it. You're going to be desiring it. Just, uh, just uh, like the ministry, the ministry is never satisfied. If you think that you're going to worship God tonight and then Friday night we'll come here and we're going to all just kick back and we're going to enjoy Friday night because Wednesday night we sufficiently sought the Lord. No, it'll be a new day. It'll be a new hour. The time for rest is when the rapture takes place. The time to rest is when your body gives up your spirit and it's over. I'm like Caleb tonight. I'm telling this church something right now. I may not be young, but I'm like Caleb. Give me that mountain. I may not be young, but I still have the fire of the Holy Ghost. I still have a hunger for the supernatural. I am hungry tonight. If you're not hungry tonight, this is what I tell people all the time. Pray prayers that God can answer. Always pray a prayer that God can answer. If you're praying a prayer that God can't answer, he won't answer it. For example, I was in a service one night, and while I was in that service, there was someone asked me to come pray for this uh, lady. And I went back there to pray for this lady. She was seeking for the Holy Ghost, and they had her in the aisles, and they were praying for her. And, and they said, Brother Winslow, come and lay hands on this woman and pray for her. And... Uh, and so I went over there to pray for her, and I started to stretch my, stretch my hand out, and the Lord said, you can pray till you're blue in the face, but she's not going to get the Holy Ghost. And I wasn't used to God telling me that. I was used to God telling me, pray for this one, they're going to get healed. Pray for this one, they're going to get the Holy Ghost. But for God to tell me when I'm stretching my hand out to pray in faith, pray all you want to, but this woman's not getting the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, Lord... I was just, I jumped back. I didn't touch her. I jumped back. And, and the Lord said, but if you'll pray the right prayer, then I'll answer the prayer. But I can't answer this prayer for her to receive the Holy Ghost because you could pray it and pray it and pray it. But if she doesn't want it, I can't give it to her till she wants it. The Spirit of God tonight is coming up against your attitude. The Spirit of God is stopping right in its tracks because your attitude is not the kind of attitude. I'm not getting on to anybody. I'm just telling you, your attitude has got to be, Lord, here I am. You do whatever you want to do with me, however you want to do with me, Lord, because I believe in you and I trust you and I know you will not hurt me. Anybody understand what I'm saying? I tried to 
maintain that attitude in my life all the time. I, I want to be ready. I want to be accessible to God. I want God to be able to, to rebuke me if he has to and to turn me around if that's what he wants me to do. I want to do exactly what God wants me to do. I have one great big passion in my life, and that is to please God, to do what God wants, to be his servant. I appreciate the accolades and the thanks and, and, and all the things that people say and, and the offerings. And, but, you know, I will tell you this, and I want the devil to know this, that if I didn't have a dollar to my name, it wouldn't change my ministry. It wouldn't change my ministry. How can you say that? Because I've already been there. And it didn't change my ministry. If I had a million dollars, I told the Lord a few weeks ago, I said, Lord, you know, you've tested me with nothing and you've tested me with a little bit. I said, Lord, why don't you just lay a million dollars on me and see if I can be faithful with a million dollars. And I said, Lord, if some reason I wasn't faithful, you could take it away. But in the back of my mind, I knew that if he gave me a month, I could do some damage to a million dollars. There wouldn't be a million left over, would it, church? I knew that I could have a new car or, or something. I could do some damage to that million dollars. Now, he may have to take more than the million away. He may have to take everything I bought away. But, but, but I, I told the Lord, Lord, if you give me a million and I'm not faithful, then you can take it away, and I'll understand that. So here's this woman, and she's praying. The Lord said, pray a prayer that I can answer. That's what you need to do tonight. You need to pray a prayer that God can answer. What pray, prayer do you need to pray? Well, where are you in God? Are you at a place you're ready for God to heal you? Then you can pray that prayer of healing. Are you ready for God to lead you? Then you can pray that prayer to be led by God. Are you ready to be empowered with gifts of the Spirit? If, is that where you're at? Then you can pray that prayer and God will answer it. But if you're not ready to be filled and you're not ready to be led by God and you're not ready for God to use you, then you need to pray a prayer that God can answer. Lord, will you get me ready? Lord, will you let me experience what I need to experience that will change my heart, my mind, my thinking so that I can pray those prayers? Is anybody with me tonight? Anybody connecting with me in the Holy Ghost? Let's stand and let's pray a prayer right now. Whatever is the prayer that you will pray, that you need to pray, you will release me if you'll pray it. Do it right now. Come on, I didn't say I was going to pray that prayer. You pray it right now in Jesus' name. Lord, send me only to the ones that are ready, God, for the gift of God tonight. Those that are not ready, Lord, would you let this service get them ready? Would you let the Spirit of God, Lord, your Spirit, anoint us and touch us and direct us that we can be ready for the supernatural tonight? For I ask it in Jesus' name. And you may be seated. I read you a scripture right there. Oh, 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 oh let me finish my story. My ADD is kicking in. I'm, I'm already moving around. Let me finish my story. So I prayed. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, give this woman an opportunity, a chance to receive your spirit. Give her a desire. Matter of fact, I even poked her on the head. And I, they were all praying with her. She had her eyes closed. I poked her on the head, and she wouldn't look at me. And then finally she opened her eyes, and I said, you don't really want the Holy Ghost, do you? And I mean, I want you to know she didn't want to answer that. She just looked at me like, are you really asking me that? And I know what she's thinking. Aren't I pretending good enough? Aren't I putting on a show enough that you would believe that I want the Holy Ghost? But she knew I was looking beyond the veil. She knew I was on the other side of the veil and that I was very close into where she was at. I said, you don't really want the Holy Ghost, do you? I said, be honest with me. She said, no, not right now. I don't want it. I said, but you know, if we prayed the right kind of prayer, now God telling me this, if we prayed the right kind of prayer, you could receive the Holy Ghost tonight and you could have the joy and you could have the deliverance and you could have the help and you could have the power of God in your life and you could walk out of here different than you came in. And she said, 
I could. I said, yes. Why don't we pray for God to give you a desire for the Holy Ghost to work in your life? And we prayed a prayer that God could answer. I'm going to say it again. We prayed a prayer that God could answer. I'm going to say it again. We prayed a prayer that God could answer. If you're praying the same prayer for 20 years, check it out. You might need to adjust your prayers a little bit so God can answer that prayer. Right? I was in a revival service. I think it was California. And uh, I was in revival, and there was a woman that would stand up, and this church took prayer requests, and, and uh, they would read them off, but uh, people could stand up. It wasn't a custom that they did, but they permitted it. And this one lady stood up, and she asked for her husband. I believe his name was Steve. And she prayed and said, I, I, she asked for prayer. I want Steve to be saved. Every night during the revival, I believe I was there about a month and a half, every night she got up and she begged for Steve to be saved. I'll be honest with you. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I like new things and new stuff, and I'm glad that every service is different. There's no service the same. In Pentecost, like every snowflake, is not the same. And, but this was driving me crazy. And I asked the pastor, I said, who is this woman? She's a member of our church. I said, who is this guy, Steve? Has he ever been to church? No, he will not come, and, and uh, don't go by and talk to him because he'll just get mad at her. And she has told me not to go by the house. I said, well, this doesn't sound right. We can't go see him. She's afraid for us to knock on the door, but she wants him saved. I said, there's something wrong here. And I said, there's something missing. We've got to pray a prayer that God can answer. Prayed for that girl. She got the Holy Ghost. Gave, prayed, laid hands and said, give her a desire. I pulled my hand off. I said, now you can get the Holy Ghost because we prayed the right prayer. And we laid hands in three or four minutes. She was speaking in tongues filled with the Holy Ghost. So I said, Lord, we've got to change the way we're praying for this guy. There's got to be another way. Seek and you shall find. Uh, ask, seek, knock. I said, Lord, we've already asked, but it's not working. Maybe we've sought, but it hasn't happened. Now it's time to do some knocking. You understand? Do some knocking on the door. And so I asked the preacher, I said, let me get this right. He's never come to church. He doesn't want anything to do with it. She wants him to be saved, no matter what she said, no matter what it takes. But we can't go talk to him. We can't go teach him a Bible study. We can't go invite him to church. We can't text him. We can't send a flyer to his house. He's going to get mad. I said, something has got to change. Number one, I'm tired of hearing about him. I don't want to hear his name anymore. I'm ready for somebody else to need the Holy Ghost. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The attitude of knocking was coming on me. And so I said, what's the address of the house where they live? He said, oh, well, you can't go by there. I said, well, I, I'm not going to go and I'm going to go by there, but I'm not going to go knock on the door. He will not know I'm there. So I, that night after church, everybody's gone. I changed my clothes. We got through eating. I went and I drove in front of that house. And I said, Lord, there he is, Steve. <laughs> Never met the man, but I feel like I know him. And, uh, and I said, Lord, there he is in that bed. He's all tucked in. Fresh sheets. The pillows smell fresh. The, the temperature's just right. He's in charge of his life. He's told his woman, shut up. I'm not going to church with you. She's crying. She's weeping. She can't even get a miracle or a blessing because her husband's lost. Everything's on hold. I said, God, this is not right. I said, Lord, we've got to have an encounter with you. We've got to have a, a meeting with you in this house. Something's got to happen. That's what the Lord told me about this service. He said, I'm going to anoint this service, and people are going to have a spiritual, powerful encounter with God. Dave, I knew you was going to be here tonight because God told me, he said, when Dave walks in, I said, Dave who? He said, you know the Dave. 
when he walks in, you let him know he's going to have an encounter with me tonight because I'm going to set up something for him in this service. If I was to go to Steve, to uh, Dave right now, that's your name, isn't it? Praise God. I, I better do a double check there. Uh, if you was to ask Dave right now, he would say, I feel something, I felt something special about this service. There, I just sensed something. There was something in the song, something in the worship, something in this service that let me know that God's got something for me tonight. I don't know how far he's drove, but I, if I remember correctly, you don't live in this town, do you? But he drove here tonight. He showed up at the right time. God knew he would be here. And God said, tell him, he's going to have an encounter with me tonight. I didn't know what I was going to pray. I just knew that if I made myself presentable to God, if I showed up in front of that house incognito, I knew that if I went like a stealth a plane and just went under the radar and didn't take anybody with me, didn't announce it. You know, everything everything you do shouldn't be told. Huh? There's some things you shouldn't, everything God tells me about somebody, he doesn't tell me to do anything with it, but just pray about it. There's some of you sitting here right now that God spoke to me and told me to pray for you, but I haven't called you out. I haven't put any oil on top of your head, but that doesn't mean God's not after, after you to give you a miracle from God. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm out in front of this house. I started praying. And all of a sudden, I saw it clearly what I need to pray. I said, Lord, first of all, I know you're going to hear my prayers. And I said, Lord, I pray right now in that bedroom, in that real nice, expensive mattress, in that beautiful, uh, nice smelling room and Beautiful sheets and nice pillow and, and uh, uh, everything's just right. The clock's not too loud. If it's too loud, it's on the other end of the house. He's got everything like he wants it. He's got his woman in place where he wants her. He's got her fearful and afraid. He's got the preacher afraid to come to the house. He's got everything just, I said, Lord, it's time to turn his world upside down. He needs an encounter from God. He needs a visitation from the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you something. Don't miss Friday night. There's going to be an encounter with God Friday night. God spoke to me today about Friday night. I said, my God, Lord, don't tell me how good the steak's going to be on Friday. I've got to eat tonight. He said, I, I'm just telling you, you tell the people that I don't care who's coming outside this church, that this church is the prime target of Friday night. And if they come, they'll just have to get what they can get. But I'm here for this church. I'm here to touch this church on Friday night. So I don't care if they show up or they don't show up. God's got something for this church. I said, God, would you just, I mean, I'm under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And I said, Lord, would you put a big rock in the mattress, underneath the mattress on the side of the bed that he's sleeping on? And don't let him be comfortable. I said, Lord, let that rock get right in the pit of his back. And don't let him sleep and get rest till he wants an encounter with you. Let him make an appointment in the Holy Ghost. And so I prayed that prayer and I left. I said, Brother Winslow, did you believe it happened? I believed it was it. I believe God put a rock in there. And so the next night I went back and I didn't stay long. I got me a malt down at Wendy's or one of those uh, freezies, whatever they're called. And, and then I went down in front of the house and I pointed, there he is, Lord, and let the rock Move it a little bit. God, get it. If he's moving over to one side, move the rock with him. That rock that followed them was Christ. I said, let the rock follow him wherever he goes. If he gets on the sofa, if he goes to the uh, guest bedroom, let the rock follow him wherever he goes. Well, I'm going to tell you about a week later, uh, the woman stood up, and this time she didn't say, let Steve, at least we changed the prayer. She didn't pray and say, oh, I want my husband saved. She got up and she said, I need all the church to pray for Steve. His back is killing him. He couldn't go to work today. You know what I said? Holy Ghost, don't 
answer that prayer. It's the wrong prayer. Y'all ain't hearing me, are you? I know I'm not screaming and jumping around and quoting 50 scriptures, but I'm telling you right now, start praying the right prayer and watch what happens. I said start praying the right prayer and watch what happens. I said, Holy Ghost, do not answer that prayer. I, ref- I stood in the way of it. I said, my prayers are stronger. I said, God, I prayed that prayer. I have the authority to take it away, and I have the authority to bring it on. Just like the prophet of God prayed for drought, he had the power to bring the rain. And I said, Lord, this guy is going to meet his Waterloo. This guy is going to meet his encounter with you, Jesus. He's either going to crawl into church, or, Lord, he's going to die cripple the rest of his life. But this guy, we're tired of hearing about I'm tired of begging God for anything. I'm ready to start believing God for the supernatural in this revival. We're not going to have church. We are having church. God's not about to move supernaturally. He is moving supernaturally. Let's shift the gear in Jesus' name. So I said, God, don't answer that prayer. Every night it got more desperate. I could tell his back was getting worse. She was getting more desperate. I was still blocking all prayers. I was standing in the way of it. I wouldn't let it happen. I said, no, God. I said, Steve's going to get saved one way or another. And, and, and I said, Lord, don't let up. I kept going by every night, reinstitutioning, reaffirming, putting more strength in it. I'd point in the house and I'd say, God, make the rock sharper, make it bigger. I mean, I just kept adding fuel to the fire. And then I walked in the church and lo and behold, here was the sister. And she wasn't sitting in the middle toward the front like she usually was, but sitting in the back and beside her was a man. And it didn't, I didn't, the Holy Ghost didn't tell me that was Steve. But I knew that was Steve because he was crooked and he was bent over like this. The man that didn't want anybody to come by. The man that didn't want any phone calls. The man that didn't want no flyers. The man that didn't want any preachers bothering him. The man that didn't want to hear about the service from his wife. The man that refused was in the house of God. Change your prayers and watch what God does. Become dangerous. Become anointed by God tonight. Get serious about the supernatural and watch what happens. So I walked by him. I I just I knew he was there. I wasn't about to, to shake his hand and say anything to him. I snubbed him like he was snubbing God. I just lifted my nose up and walked by him. I didn't even say hi or anything to him. But about two foot past him, I heard a weak little hurt voice say, are you the preacher? And I turned and said, oh, excuse me, are you speaking to me? And he said, yes. He said, are you the, are you the guy that's praying for the sick around here? And she said, yes, that's Brother Winslow right there. He said, mister, he said, would you pray for me? I thought, oh, uh-huh, come on now. Huh? Come on now. I wanted to say, I don't know, I might. I mean, that's what I wanted to do, but, that, but I'm not in charge. I, God, we don't get nowhere with that attitude, but we're praying the right prayer. It's working. He's in the house of God. I looked at him, I said, you know, I got a feeling that God's fixing to heal you tonight. I said, there's something coming. I didn't say the Lord told me. I said, there's something because I was fixing to move that prayer off of him. I said, I've got a feeling you're getting healed tonight. He said, if you want to call me out, just call me. He said, my name is Steve. I said, I think I remember your name. Just do whatever you feel like needs to be. I'm telling you right now, your God knows how to whip every devil, every demon, every sickness, every spirit. Just adjust. Just adjust your prayers a little bit tonight and watch what happens.
Don't say, Lord, heal me so I can start uh, skiing again. Heal me so I can start jogging again. You need to say, Lord, heal me so I can give a testimony. So that, see, just adjust your prayers a little bit. Say, Lord, heal me so I can do more for you. So I can be a testimony. I can be a witness. in the service I said "All right, Mr. Steve back there it's your time right now I've never prayed a prayer so easy to remove a sickness off anybody I've never prayed so so just so easily oh God heal this man right now in the name of Jesus and I want you to know he stood straight up and he said oh my goodness he said I have no pain whatsoever But I made him promise me he'd get baptized. I made him promise me he'd seek for the Holy Ghost. I said, if the Lord lifts this off of you, I should have said, and you're going to have to give me $500 for my ministry. I I, I should have, but I didn't. You know, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. I'm going to tell you what, you get down in your back like he was, you'd give your shoes, you'd give your best dog, you'd give anything to be healed. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? If you've never been sick, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you've ever been sick, you know exactly what I'm saying. Healed completely. Received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Was baptized in Jesus' name. You don't know. I might have been by your house last night. You're sitting here and you don't even really, you think you're really smart. You, 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 you got your arms folded and you got your lip hanging out. And you, you, think you, you really think you're in charge. And you may not even know there's something on its way to your house tonight that within a few days you're going to be willing to do anything God wants you to do. God began to speak to me, and I want to hasten on. God began to speak to me, and he told me about Jacob. And I've read the story of Jacob all my life. And I know what kind of man Jacob was. He was born with a split personality. He was born with a desire for the things of God. He wanted the birthright. He wanted the blessings of God. When he was born, he reached up and grabbed his own brother's ankle and desired to have the blessings of God, the birthright. The one born first had a double portion. He wanted the double portion. Remember, it was old Jacob that caught his brother hungry and tired and made him trade out uh, his blessings for just a bowl of soup. It was Jacob that wrapped the goat skin around his uh, arms and made his way into the house where his father was, who was on his deathbed. And his vision was dim and he couldn't see. And he walked in there and he said to him, I'm, I'm, I'm Esau, the oldest, and I brought the Vincent, the deer meat that you've asked for. And he really had goat meat. And he really had the hair and the skin of the goat around his arms because his brother was a hairy man. And, and the Bible tells us that his father said, you, you have the voice of, of Jacob. And he felt his arms. He said, but you have the arms of Esau. And he put a blessing on his head. And he prayed a blessing upon the life of this man called Jacob. And then his father and his mother, when all this came to the surface, and his brother vowed that when his father died, he was going to slay and kill Jacob. The Bible said that they sent Jacob away. And he was packing quickly and he got his camel and he rode out of the town and he was going somewhere far away from Esau. At least Esau slay him and kill him. And when he was alone and by himself and when all of his plans were a mess and nothing was working right, he wanted the things of God. Reminds me of the Tower of Babel. They built a temple, a tabernacle, a religious place. But there was no God in that place. There was no great God of heaven and earth. They were building a tabernacle whose top was going to reach the heavens. And they were on their own trying to reach the things of God without God's help. And that's exactly what Jacob was doing. He wasn't doing it God's way. 
He wasn't asking. He wasn't seeking. He wasn't knocking the right way. He was going about it wrong. But God saw his hunger and God saw his desire. That's why God's going to visit this church tonight. That's why God's going to give you a place to touch him that he can touch you tonight. That's why in all of your seeking for your healings and all your seeking for your financial miracles, you failed. You've come up short. You've gotten mad with God. You've gotten angry, but yet you know it's in him. You know where the answer is and God has just brought you along and gave you another day and another hour to seek him because he knows there's going to be a special meeting place. He knows there's going to be an encounter with him that's going to change your life forever. God told me, he said, I'm going to give you the power to pray encounters in the lives of, their, of family members in this church. People that need miracles, people that need healing, people that need a touch, people that need, need salvation. God said, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves tonight and seek my face, I will put an encounter between their loved ones and me. They will run into me. They will come into me because I will stand in their path. I will get where they are. I will go where they're going and they will run into to me and I will deal with them and I will touch them. Many of you that sought God and you've asked for healing and miracles and signs and wonders but you never realize that it wasn't the miracle that God wanted you to seek. That might have been the first thing that brought you to God. But once you came in this house there should have been something in this house that got a hold of you that made you forget about your need of healing. There ought to be something inside of you. You ought to be like the one leper that turned around and came back and came to worship God. And he said, well, wasn't there 10 of you? And he said, yes, but I don't know what happened to the rest. And the Lord commended him. And the Lord saw him because he turned and came back. When Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, the Bible said Martha was the first one that went out to him. And she looked in his face and she started saying words of condemnation. I thought you was his friend. I thought you loved him. I thought you cared about him. And all she could do was put her finger in the face of God. You can either shake your finger in the face of God tonight or take that finger down and lift your hands up and say you're the God of the universe. You're the God of everything in my life And whatever you put in my path There's nothing I can say about it I'm going to serve you if you help me I'm going to serve you if you bless me I'm going to serve you if you don't God said every person I pray for tonight By the laying on the hands Is going to get an encounter from God God said every person that comes to the altar at the closing of this service, it's going to get an encounter with God. Do you realize how powerful an encounter with God is? You could get one healing. It wouldn't equal an encounter with God. You could get a financial miracle, a check for $50,000 tonight, but it would come and it would go. But an encounter with God stays with you the rest of your life. You know why I am what I am? Because in 1973, on April the 6th, I had an encounter with the Holy Ghost. I wasn't raised Pentecost. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to worship. I didn't know any of those things. But one moment in an altar, and God touched me, and I was never the same. I am what I am tonight because April the 6th, 1973, I had an encounter with God. I've been healed multiple times because I had an encounter with God. I've had financial miracles because I had an encounter with God. You're trying to get a miracle. You're trying to get something from God. It's like trying to milk the cow. Why milk the cow when God wants to give you the cow? 
Why beg for a bottle of drop when God says, I'll give you the whole thing? You've got it backwards. You're praying the wrong prayers. You're seeking it backwards. You're coming the wrong way. God says, come and have an encounter with me and I'll give you whatever you need. I know it sounds crazy and I really mean this. That if God never healed me, I wouldn't stop serving him. If I lived in poverty all the days of my life and I know what the scripture says and I don't have to live in poverty and I don't have to live in sickness. But if I did, I would not stop living for God because I have had an encounter with God. When I stood in front of Dr. Howell, the, uh, the preacher of the first church of the Frigidaire, and he was telling me there's no Holy Ghost, there's no tongue talking, stay away from those Pentecostals. There was nothing stopping me. And with all of his degrees and all of his doctorates and all of his paper on the wall, I had paper, but it was in the bathroom. But I, I want to tell you something right now. Hallelujah, all of that knowledge that he had, and yet he didn't even know how to have an encounter with God. He had never had a personal encounter with the Holy Ghost. And all of his PhDs driving LTDs, he still didn't have an encounter with God if you're in this building tonight and you have had an encounter with God that's what's going to bring your healing that's what's going to bring your miracle that's what's going to get you out of hock my God I feel the Holy Ghost in this building right now God is fixing to give this church supernatural, powerful encounters with God. You may be seated. You can ask every preacher on this platform, and they will tell you they had an encounter with God. If I'm not telling the truth, and don't do it right now in the middle of my sermon, but pastor, straighten me out. I believe you've had a mighty encounter with God. Brother Sapp, I look at you. I admire you, Brother Sapp. I'm going to tell you that right now. Not many men could walk where you're walking right now. But you mark my words one day. That encounter you had with God that's bringing you through this valley is going to put you in places in the Holy Ghost that you couldn't get there on your own. That man's had an encounter with God. People coming out, it's raining. It's Wednesday night. You're not here because you had plenty of sleep. You're not here because, you know, it's just the easiest thing to do. You didn't have anything to watch and nowhere to go and nothing to do. No, you're here because somewhere in your life you had an encounter with God and it taught you something. If a thousand fall to your left and 10,000 to your right, you're saying, it shall not come nigh unto me. I will not surrender. I will not let up. And here is Jacob fleeing for his life and he's running from his brother Esau. What did he want? He wanted the favor of God. He wanted the blessings of God. He wanted everything that God had promised the firstborn. Yes, he went about it wrong. But you know what the Bible says? It's strange that Jacob lied. Jacob cheated. Jacob was a deceiver. And yet the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. When I first read that as a new convert, I said, there must be something wrong with my Bible. And I went and got another Bible. I thought it was a misprint. Surely he wouldn't have said, I love Jacob. It wasn't Jacob's actions that he loved. And that's where we're making a mistake. We come to church and we're not doing right, but God's helping us. And we think that justifies our wrong. No, it doesn't. It just says that God sees the hunger that you've got. It doesn't mean you're right. It doesn't mean your life may be right. God sees something about your hunger. I could never explain all of our trials. I couldn't make myself or you understand all the trials you've been through. But when you've had an encounter with God, there's a silent confirmation. There's a silent voice of God that's leading you and guiding you through all your troubles and all your trials. When the wind is blowing against your house and everything is against you, yet there's a silent majority of, of the Spirit of God that's with you that says no demon can bring you down. No sickness is going to tackle you. 
you. You're not going down to foreclosure. My hand is on you. I'm going to show up. It might be the last second, but I'll be there. The Bible said Jacob in his loneliness, his emptiness, fleeing from his his brother's uh, vengeance and hatred and malice and he's fleeing out from his father's house and his mother and the Bible said on a long, long day of riding and the clouds come over the sky and the sun sets and the darkness envelops him and finally he realizes he can't go any further that night. He's gone as as far as he can go. When you get to the place where you've gone as far as you can go, there's going to be an encounter with God. You still got a little strength to reject God? You're not going to have your encounter yet. You're still holding on, rejecting God, holding back, not giving yourself to God? You're still not going to have your encounter with God. But when you say, that's it, God, I've fought this, I've come against it, I've, I've done everything else but obey you. And tonight, God, I'm releasing myself to all these carnal physical activities and I'm going to get zoned into the Holy Ghost. You watch what God does. God said, this is the night. He slides off his camel. He pulls the saddle and the pack and the food and what garments he's carried with him and he lays them down. They mean nothing to him now. All the things that he fought for means nothing to him. The mode, the method that he was using has gotten him nowhere. I want to ask you tonight, where has your rejection of God gotten you? Are you any better off by not seeking Him, by not praying, by not yielding to Him? Are you any better off by staying home and not coming to the house of God? Do you have more money in the bank by not giving to God? Are you really better off? You know you can't say that you are because you're not. But look around you at the people that come to God's house that give to God that worship God that pray look at their laughter look at their smiles look at their ministry look at their praise look at their worship look what God's doing because they gave up they surrendered they let go they let God You, you guys better get ready. This church is fixing to have Holy Ghost revival. And I don't care what the world says. And I don't care what the finances says. And I don't care what the building says. Something unbelievable is going to happen in the front of this building tonight. God promised me we were going to have a Holy Ghost encounter in the front of this building tonight. What would you do if you got up without anybody calling you out and laying hands on you and your leg came uncrippled while you were on the way to the front of this building? What would happen if you threw yourself at the mercy of God tonight and within 24 hours your son called you on the phone and said, I'm coming home, but I'm coming different. What if you got a call within a few weeks? Mama, guess what? They're letting me out of prison. I don't know why, but I just found out I'm being released. Would you have the courage to tell him I fell on my face on that Wednesday night and I had an encounter with God? We're not offering you to shake the preacher's hand. Who cares what Brother Winslow can do? I'm so sick of Brother Winslow, I'm fed up to hear with him. Who is he? He's nothing. But this God of Brother Winslow, this God of this man of God, the God of this church is who I want to have an encounter with. The Bible says he lays down and takes his little roll that he sleeps on and he's not comfortable. He doesn't have any pillows. He doesn't have all the plush that he had at the house. And now in this lonely, empty place, he rolls out some old piece of hair of a blanket that he lays on, softens it as much as he can. He's not comfortable. He can't get his head adjusted right. 
He can't get his head just where it needs to be. Some of you, you can't get your mind just where it needs to be. And God says, tonight's the night. I touch your mind if you let me. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Finally, he pulls a rock. Can you imagine that? For a pillow, he has a rock. Your trials are so hard. Your troubles are so difficult. They're like hard rocks. When you go to sleep at night, it's like a rock under your head. Your comfort is gone. That, that anointing zone has disappeared. But God says, I brought you to this place so that I can give you an encounter with me unlike any time you've ever had an encounter with me. And all of a sudden, he falls to sleep. And a dream breaks through that dimension of doubt and unbelief. And it's not just an ordinary dream. It's a heavenly dream. And now he's not just dreaming about dying and swords and blood, but his vision is higher. His dreams are not earthly. His dreams are heavenly. I'm telling you tonight, God will not let you down if you lift up your dreams higher. I know you're afraid to dream. I know you're afraid to believe because you're so afraid that it won't happen. You're afraid to step out and be used of God, afraid to step out and work the altars, afraid to tell the man of God, Look, train me, I want to work in Sunday school, train me, I want to do door knocking, train me, I want to get a Bible study ch chart. And I know you're so fearful of failing. It's only that fear that's keeping you from that encounter with God. And now his dreams are high and lofty because a ladder is between earth and heaven. I want you to know that ladder was there all the time. That miracle power was present around you every day of your life. It didn't just appear. Just because now you see it, you think it was there. He was there all the time. He was there at your birth. He was there at every stage of your life. I remember one time I heard my name called. I turned around. I was 12 years old. I heard my name called. I turned around. No one was there. Later that day, I heard my name for the second time called. I turned and I jerked and I looked around. And then I heard my name for the third time and I looked and I knew there was no one could tell me that I didn't hear my name. I heard someone call my name. Years later, I found a man, the Bible, as a young man, his name was called three times. And finally, the, the priest had enough sense to say, next time you hear your name, call on the Lord. And tell the Lord, here I am, Lord. When you can tell the Lord you're ready, when you can tell the Lord, here I am, God, I'm ready now, you're going to get a miracle like you've never gotten a miracle. Are you ready to give up yet? Are you still ready to fight God and come against God? Are you ready to give up and yield to God? Are you ready to yield your life to God? Yield your tongue to God? Yield your spirit to God? If you are, you're going to have an encounter with God tonight like you've never had in your entire life. And so here's these angels coming up and going down and coming up and going down and coming up and going down. I remember three times I was 14 years old. I ran away from home and I was going to be arrested for some little breaking in little places and stealing money out of little uh, like phones and things of that nature. Me and four guys and, and I just in a lot of trouble. And, and so I thought I'm going to run away. And so I, I was on my way to Houston, Texas. And, and I got picked up and it was a preacher. And he gave me a message. He said, you need to go back home. Second time, I got picked up again. I said, let me out here. I didn't want any preacher. I didn't want to ride with a preacher. And I got out, and, and all of a sudden, uh, got another ride. And, and the man said the same thing. How old are you? I said, I'm 18. He said, you look 14. Same thing the first preacher said. He said, I'm a preacher. You need to go home. That was the second one. I said, here's where I get off, right here. I wasn't about to ride around in there with a preacher. And then finally I got another ride and I got in and I looked at him and I said, he doesn't look like a preacher. Surely this is not a preacher. But yes, he said, I'm a preacher. And he said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Houston, going to work. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. He said, you look more like you're 14. And about that time the rain came down. It's pouring down rain. And there was a man standing on the side, right beside the road with a coat on, pulled up over around his, his head and, he is just pouring down, white hair, an older man. 
And this preacher said, stop. He said, we got to pick this guy up. He wasn't hitchhiking. He wasn't saying anything. He was just standing there. The preacher said, roll the window down. Ask him, does he want to ride? I couldn't even get the words out of my mouth, and he'd already opened the door up. Got in and sat down. Wasn't saying anything. The preacher said, oh, it's cold out there. It's raining, and, you know, it's a bad night to be out. And What are you doing out there? But the man never said a word. All he said was, young man, you need to turn around and go back home because you're going in the wrong direction. And then he said, here's where I get out. The man had been in the car but three minutes. And the preacher put the brakes on, was about to turn to tell him, well, look, we'll take you wherever you want. It's raining. And before he could say a word, the door was shut and he got out. And no more had he got out than the preacher opened the door and looked and couldn't find him. Gone. He gets back in and he says, I don't know. He said, the man's gone. He turned around and shined the lights. He couldn't find him. And then he looked at me and he said, he told you to go back home. He, he gave you a message. And I read later on when I got saved, beware, lest you entertain angels unaware. Could it be tonight that God has designed this service to touch every one of us to get us to a place of an encounter with him and a place of a life change. That would have been enough to, for most of us to have a ladder. And Jacob said, this is a place that's special. It's a, it's a special place with God. And he said, I'm going to make a monument here. And I'm going to name it Bethel. It's a place of God. I had an encounter. But he had one more greater encounter than that. And that was after he'd served his father-in-law. And God had spoke to him and said, it's time to go back home. And he's fearful of Esau. He's fearful of what he, he'll face. Many of you, I'll tell you, if you'll let God tonight, you will not face the same things you faced when you walked in the door of this church. There's some of you, I'm telling you, hear me. You're going to get a miracle of healing tonight. God's going to do it. No one's going to do it for you. God's going to do it himself. But you're going to have to let him get a hold of you. The Bible said that he told Jacob, send everybody ahead, but you stay behind. This is between you and God. This is not about anybody else. Don't bring your husband and your wife in if this, if that. Forget those things. Send everything ahead of you. And be the last one because you're going to meet an angel. And that angel is going to have a wrestling match with you. And the Bible said Jacob grabs that angel and he recognizes this is an angel of blessing. God told me he was going to send three angels of blessings to this church tonight. And if your faith is enough to get a hold of God, if you can get to the front of this building in a few moments and say, God, here I am. Do whatever you want to do with me. It doesn't matter. God said, I'm going to let you have a supernatural encounter with God. There's young people tonight that's going to get a touch from God just like I did when I was 12 years old. You know when God called me to preach? When I was 12. At 12 years old, God called me to preach. I didn't know what it was, but His Spirit came upon me. He called my name three times. That very day that He called my name, He called me to preach. I had a Bible put in my hands that day. I'd never owned a Bible. And when it was in my hands, it began to shake and it began to heat up. And I could feel the physical heat of that word. And it began to speak to me. And I took the pages and I turned it. And I wept and I cried as a 12-year-old. And the Spirit of God came upon me. If I'd known what the Holy Ghost was, I could have gotten the Holy Ghost right then called to preach right then not knowing what to do but later on I had another encounter when I walked in that church 22 years old and God forgave me and gave me the Holy Ghost and I was called to preach within hours of getting the Holy Ghost I remember when I told somebody at church God called me to preach and they said oh that wasn't God you can't be called that soon I didn't dare tell them the truth is he called me back in, when I was 12 years old but they wouldn't have understood that. And so I didn't tell them anything. I pondered it. I thought it. 
But God said, I'm going to give you an encounter. The Bible said he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And he told that angel, it's different now. He wasn't deceiving. He wasn't lying. He wasn't tricking. He wasn't trying to get the blessing the wrong way. Things were different now. Now, he was coming honestly, openly before God. And you know, we told that angel, how dare him. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. My God, could you dare have that kind of attitude tonight? Could you dare right now ask God? Well, I don't have that right now. Well, then could you ask God to give you that desire? Could it be possible that you could pray and say, God, give me that kind of desire. That I could say, I'm going to get a hold of this and I'm not going to let it go. Let's stand together right now. Don't, don't anybody move yet. Just stand with me right now in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell you God's going to meet you in the front of this building. And I'm going to tell you what's up here. I'm going to tell you there's miracles, signs, and wonders at this altar. This whole area is the altar. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to pray for somebody. I'm going to pray for one person in this service. I could pray for 25 or 30 people because God's speaking to me. This woman with a black cap on and the, the brownish, dark looking uh, blouse there. God said he wants to heal you tonight. I could point through this congregation and tell you people that God wants to heal in this building. I'm going to pray for this man. And the blue polo shirt there, the, the, the T-shirt with the collar on the blue one there, uh, in the right here on the this side, inside, right here. You, brother, I'm going to pray for you. Yes, God's fixed to heal you tonight. Come on up here. This, this man right here. You can come too. That's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. I was actually talking to this brother right here. Yeah, no, no, no. You st- you stepped out by faith, and God's going to heal you too. God knows what he's doing in this house. You hear me? You think it's the first time I've had somebody else step out? No. And every time they stepped out, God has spoke to me and said, they stepped out by faith, and I've got enough power to heal both of them in Jesus' name. How, how, how many believe tonight that God heals? God can heal every diabetic in this building right now. You believe that, brother? God can heal every diabetic in this building. You believe God can heal everybody's feet, legs, that have the burning, the stinging, and the lack of circulation in their legs? You believe God can heal everybody like that in this building? We just had a lady Sunday night that was healed right in the middle of the preaching, didn't we, brothers? I mean, I'm preaching. I'm not even working in the gifts of the Spirit. And right in the middle of our sermon, God spoke to me and said, you pray for her right now, and I'm going to heal this woman. I'm going to touch her, and it's going to set the stage for everybody else in this building. And I, I know we're going to have to really rush this time, and I understand, Pastor, and I'm going to try to really get this to where we need to be. And I want us all that when it's time to leave this service tonight and get out of this building for, on, on time. Pastor has looked ahead. Friday night we're going to have church as long as we need to. How many appreciate the man of God for that? That's your man of God that did that. I want you to know, we went Sunday night to preach somewhere, and the pastor, he, he, he pastor, I love you. No, 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 I'm, no, I don't want love back right now. I'm telling you, the pastor, you know what he said? He was sitting in there looking at that beautiful building, and I know I'm wasting time here, but I, Brother Cal said, I want my people to have a church building where they can fellowship as long as they want to where they can talk to each other and they can have church and they can pray. And he said, I look around, I watch all these people talking and fellowshipping and laughing. And he said, I've got to go around and hurt everybody up and get them out of the building. He's got a pastor's heart, don't he? Do you know your faith can make it happen? Let's start believing God. Let's come to the front of this building and say, Lord, we don't know how you're going to do it. We don't know how it's going to get done, but God, you're going to help us get a building. It's not going to be some supernatural evangelist going to come in here and prophesy us a building. He's not going to get in a car and drive all over the city and say, I feel like that's the Holy Ghost right there. But you could come and seek the face of God. I don't want you to get, please do not moan or groan yet, but just come and stand with me. Don't moan and groan yet. I want you to get ready to have an encounter with God. 
If you've got to moan and grow, if you need to repent, do it. But don't walk out of here down and downcast. God said, I'm going to meet you right up here in the front of this building, and you're going to have an encounter from God in the name of Jesus. We may not have but three minutes to pray it, but that's all it's going to take. We're going to pray for this brother right now in Jesus' name, and we're going to believe that God's going to heal him, and then we're going to pray for everybody across this building. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell everybody in just a moment, seek the face of God and have an encounter with God. And we're going to do two things all at one time. I'm going to be calling people out, and you're going to be seeking God for yourself, and I'm going to be laying hands on people, and we're going to be praying and believing God. Friday night, we're getting out what time, Pastor? 10 o'clock? Do y'all hear me? We're going to have some, we're going to tear this building up Friday night. We're going to sop, we're going to eat the biscuit. We're going to eat the gravy. And then forgive me, but I've done it. We're going to lick the plate. Pastor, we're going to make up the difference in the offering. Friday night, you watch. God's going to give us a supernatural offering in here. Not for Brother Winslow. God's going to give you a supernatural offering for sticking your neck out and believing God. A turtle gets nowhere if he don't stick his neck out. We're going to pray. Come on up here, brother, in the front up here. We're going to pray for you in Jesus' name right now. Get some oil, somebody, and let's lay hands. I, I've not been in any hurry tonight. I, I really envision preaching 15 or 20 minutes and praying for a bunch of people. But God said, I'm in charge. You'll do what I tell you to do. I mean, that's what he told me today. He got on to me Monday morning or Monday night. I didn't go to sleep. Can you believe this? I got up at uh, 8.30 Sunday morning. I preached Sunday morning here. I did not take a nap. I preached Sunday night in another place. We drove back and got home 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and I went to bed at 5, 30. I could not sleep because God was talking to me. And he said, you did good, but you didn't do great. I said, well, my God, everybody was slapping me on the back, God. Yeah, they were slapping you on the back, but I wasn't. He said, you're in a big hurry. You're trying to get everything done. Did I tell you to get in a hurry? Did I tell you that you had to be all over the building? He said, you've been better off listening to me and praying for whoever I told you to pray for and let the people pray for everybody else. The Lord said, are you going to start listening to me or not? I said, yes, God, I'm going, to, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. He said, then that's it. If you'll start doing what I tell you to do, he said, this church is going to have major breakthrough in the Holy Ghost, not just while you're here, but they're going to have a major breakthrough in this church. If I was to tell you, and I'm not talking about you, but if I was to tell you tonight that God wants to heal cancer in this building, would you believe it right now? That's what I'm telling you right now. If I was to, there's three things that God told me he was going to do. If I was to tell you that God's going to heal cancer, if I told you that God was going to heal incurable diseases, would you believe it? If I was going to tell you that, and I know this is not everybody, but God said I'm going to break the spirit of witchcraft off this region. I'm going to break the spirit of superstition. God said, I'm going to start shutting down the palm readers and the tarot card. If I was to tell you that God spoke to me and said, told me, said, I'm tired of this city binding my church. I'm tired of this city dictating to me. I was to tell you, God's going to give you a major breakthrough in this city. God's going to give you favor in ways you never dreamed you could have it. Would you believe God with me right now? If I was to tell you that you're going to go home and your stepchildren are going to change, would you dare believe God right now? If I was to tell you those terrible dreams that you've been having are stopping tonight right now in their place and that secret attack of pornography is being